Spring 1862 was a dark time for the Confederacy. Defeats along the Mississippi River Valley, along the North Carolina coast, and a huge Union army was posed and poised in Washington, D.C., ready to strike at the Confederate capital when, on the afternoon of March 8, 1862, the CSS Virginia will emerge from the Elizabeth River and change the tide of naval warfare and, in many ways, the tide of the war. So our story today really focuses on this ship. Uh, this is the CSS Virginia, often called the Merrimack. And I have to tell you the bridge tunnel uh, that crosses between Newport News Point and um, Chesapeake uh, is actually incorrectly named and spelled because Merrimack, the steam screw frigate, um, was actually, whoops, um, was actually spelled M-E-R-R-I-M-A-C-K. All the plans and everything. Named for the Merrimack River in New Hampshire. So everyone drops the K because it's easier to spell, I guess, with newsprint. Uh, but, of course, on February 17, 1862, the ship will be christened and commissioned with a new name, known as the CSS Virginia. So when I'm talking from a Northern perspective, I will use the term Merrimack because that's what they use constantly. When I'm talking from a Southern perspective, I'll call it the CSS Virginia. So just to keep confusion away. So basically on April 21st, 1861, the Confederacy received a godsend when they entered into the burning ashes of the Gosport Navy Yard. And there they'll find amidst the ruins the wrecked USS Merrimack. Now, you know, the Federals abandoned the Gosport Navy Yard. They torched everything they could although they did a terrible job. You actually can go into the Monitor Center and see one of the guns they tried to destroy, a nine-inch Dahlgren shell gun, and you can see where they took sledgehammers trying to break off the Castable, the Trunnions. It was a failure. Uh, in fact, they didn't burn the foundry. In fact, with the Merrimack, they uh, set it afire actually was done by uh, uh, Lieutenant Henry Augustus Wise. However, someone pulled the seacocks. And so my big question always is, how well does a burning ship burn when it sinks? Not well. And as a result of that, the Confederacy is able to raise the Merrimack, cut it down to its berth deck, and transform it into a powerful ironclad ram, then called the CSS Virginia. Now, what are some of the real great aspects of the ship as we look at it in dry dock at Gosport Navy Yard? <clears throat> you can see uh, <clears throat> this is the shield and also known as the casemate. It is made of 24 inches of pine and oak. It is also uh, covered by two layers of two inch iron plate. Plate is made in Tredegar Ironworks. One of the challenges with this project is getting that iron down from Richmond to Portsmouth. Eventually they have to put it on a train, take it down to Weldon, North Carolina. Then they have to pick it up and put it on another train to send it up to Portsmouth. So Confederate infrastructure is really strained in trying to build this vessel. So um, it also is armed. This ship is designed to sink wooden vessels. Okay, so number one, we have the ram. If I ever get this thing to focus, there you go. That is a 1,500-pound cast iron ram. And that's something that's used or put on the ship 
because ramming used to, you know, you think about Ben-Hur, the film, you know, ramming speed, oh my gosh. That's how they used to fight back in uh, the Greco-Roman ages. However, with the invention of cannon, you can't go fast enough to ram the ship before you get blown out of the water, so no one builds rams anymore after really the 16th century. However, what are the advantages of the Virginia? Number one, it's iron-plated. Just remember, the water submerges the ends, the fantail and the bow, uh, so your only target really is that shield. So when attacking a wooden warship, you have the ram that will effectively, as we'll learn today, <clears throat> damage an enemy ship. Then it's armed with 10 cannon, and those cannon are some of the finest types of cannon that existed in the United States during or at the beginning of the Civil War. The bow gun is a seven inch brook gun invented by John Mercer Brook. This gun uh, was capable of firing not only conical shells, but also brook bolts. And a brook bolt is the first armor piercing projectile created. So, uh, but the Virginia let those all up in Richmond, believe it or not. And so that's gonna cause problems for the March 9th engagement. So it has a seven inch Brook gun, two 6.4 Brook guns. Then the uh, rest of the broadside will be six nine inch Dahlgrens. Now, if you wanna see what a Brook gun looks like, just go into the monitor center and you'll see that as well as a nine inch Dahlgren. <clears throat> And then um, on the stern would have another seven inch Brook gun in pivot. And so this makes it a very powerful um, ship indeed, just by its armament. I want to say, you know, you see guns poking out here and here. Well, I have to tell you that that was a pivot mount, so they can't poke out of both gun ports at the same time. So. Uh, it's always fun to look at Civil War images and say, well, they did that one wrong. And uh, I, I did that with my son many years ago. <laughs> so anyway, Hampton Roads is a tremendous, how can I say, amphitheater. Because if you stand at Newport News Point on Fort Monroe, Sewell's Point, Willoughby Spit, you name it, you have this broad view of of the Hampton Roads Harbor. Now the Hampton Roads Harbor is uh, the largest natural harbor in the world. It is, it is formed by the James River, the Nazareth River, and the Elizabeth River. And you can see it's a huge anchorage. Um, it is deep water. However, there's a lot of shoals and so you can see by this map, uh, number one, where uh, uh, the dotted line shows the area where the Virginia, with its huge draft of 22 feet, uh, could operate within the confines of Hampton Roads. Now, what you'll also see here is where the Union happened to be. You have to realize for the first year of the war, if I was at Fort Monroe, I look across at Sewell's Point and there was a Confederate flag and a battery over there. You know, we didn't send smoke signals or anything, but we're looking at each other. So the Federals control what is known as Newport News Point um, and they have a fortification there known as Camp Butler, uh, which also has a, a battery um, that has four Columbiads. Uh, then uh, you would, in today's world, uh, you would uh, go 16th Street over to Kickatan, and all of a sudden, Kickatan takes you to um, Fort Monroe, in essence, you know. Uh, and, and Fort Monroe is the largest moat encircled fortification in uh, the world, believe it or not. Um, it is, of course, the moat is 1.3 miles in circumference. And so it is a major fort 
controlling the entrance to Hampton Roads, along with what was then known as Fort, um, uh, Fort Calhoun, or Castle Calhoun, also known as the Battery on the Rip Raps. It's facing the wrong way. You know, it's facing out towards the Chesapeake Capes. Nevertheless, uh, uh, it is controlled by the Union as well. So, um, and Hampton Roads is the headquarters of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, which means that uh, we have many ships there because rumors of the Merrimack conversion began to emerge uh, from Gosport Navy Yard uh, via Northern sympathizers, escaped, uh, escaped enslaved people, um, travelers. You know, there was a truce boat that went uh, across Hampton Roads to transfer mail and, as well as people traveling uh, to, you know, if I'm going from Memphis to the north, I had to come through Norfolk and go that way. Uh, and so there was a truce boat. But um, uh, news about the ship's conversion was being heard. And eventually, uh, by July, the Federals, 1861, began to pay attention to it. They set up the ironclad board, which result in the development of three different ironclads. That's the story tomorrow. Now, um, basically, um, the Federals have pretty powerful ships here. Uh, you can see uh, the Cumberland, uh, where it was located, uh, actually it's closer to Newport News Point. Next to it well, in the Cumberland was a Reseed uh, sloop of war uh, with 24 guns. The next to it is going to be the 44 gun frigate, sailing frigate uh, known as the Congress. At Fort Monroe is going to be the steam screw frigate Minnesota, the steam screw frigate Roanoke. Roanoke has 42 guns. The Minnesota had 47 guns. And then also the sailing frigate, the St. Lawrence. And they're all anchored near Fort Monroe. So basically, we have a huge, you know, when you start to add up all the guns, the Confederate ironclad is going to face over 300 cannon. And you think about that, and they just have 10. So you think about that, you have to really think uh, about, um, so this is Newport News Point. This is right after they uh, set up the camp there known as Camp Butler. Um, and uh, so this is the man that's going to be given command of the U CSS Virginia. This is Franklin Buchanan. Born on September 17th, 1800 in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he joins the Navy at age 15. Uh, he will be noted for his bravery, his dynamic leadership. I think some of the high points of his career uh, would be he's the first Navy officer to step foot in Japan. He's there with Commodore Perry, uh, Matthew Galbraith Perry. He also is commander of the Washington Navy Yard when the war breaks out. Uh, he is from Talbot County by this time. Uh, he marries into a very wealthy Talbot County family. And as a result of that, when the war breaks out or war clouds come and then breaks out, the Baltimore riot on April 19th, 1861, prompts him to resign from the U.S. Navy. So I cannot raise my sword against my native state. Well, as a result of that, uh, Maryland does not leave the Union. So he sends a letter to the Secretary of Navy, the Union's Secretary of Navy, Gideon Wells, says, whoops, I was a little hasty. You know, I can't have my job back. And of course, across the letter, Wells says, you are dismissed from the service. You know, basically, you are a traitor. So now a free agent, Buchanan joins the Confederate Navy, and he's given command of the uh, James River defenses with the Virginia as his flagship. So 
basically, uh, you know, there it is once again. Um, now, this is Newport News Point, right? Uh, this is March 7th. Uh, so what we see here is the Congress to the left. In the center is the Tug Zouave. And to the right is the uh, sailing sloop of war, the Cumberland. Now, they have the Zouave there because these ships are sailing ships, so they have to go somewhere. The best way is to use a tug, and that's what the Zouave is, an armed tug. So this is the Cumberland as a frigate. I'd said that it had been Razid. That means... Um, in the 1850s, it had been cut down uh, so that it's less expensive to operate. It gets a new battery. Um, and so this ship has what is called a 70-pounder pivot rifle. There's nothing like that in the U.S. Navy inventory. So it's probably a 60-pounder parrot rifle in pivot. It's got, uh, of course, 9-inch Dahlgrens in broadside and another pivot gun, which is a 10-inch Dahlgren. So we actually have a pretty powerful ship here, except it's a sailing ship. With it, of course, uh, and the commander of that ship is this man, George Upan Morris. Now, the news of the Virginia was everywhere in February of 1862. I have to tell you that... Um, some officers in the U.S. Navy says, oh, we're tired of hearing about her. We want her to come out and give us a, give us a shot at her, right? And that's uh, a commander, um, Gershon Jacques Henry Van Brunt, commander of the Minnesota. So all these people are saying, come on, you know, where are you? And they think it's almost mythical. So on March 8th, 1862, the Virginia at about noon will pull away from the quay at Gosport Navy Yard. Thousands of people are lining the water side, just, you know, waving at this great hope of the Confederacy, this hope that would change naval warfare forever. Newspapers in the South were all saying, this, this, this ship will capture New York. Of course, it couldn't get there, uh, but it will capture Washington, D.C. So nevertheless, um, so she pulls away from the, um, the bank and down the Elizabeth River, and uh, they see the engines work. Um, Franklin Buchanan calls um, to Ashton Ramsey, the chief engineer of the ship, saying, you know, are we, uh, I'm thinking about ramming the enemy's vessels. Is the engine properly stabilized? Ashton Ramsey says, yes, the engine's working very well. See, why the Merrimack had been originally in Gosport Navy Yard was because of faulty engines. And so they had to um, um, basically, uh, was, the, the engines were all taken apart and everything. Uh, and uh, uh, so they were cantankerous. And so everyone said, these are the best engines we have in the South, so we're going to use them in building our first ironclad. So what's going to happen, basically, is that they pull down the Elizabeth River, and then they get abreast of Craney Island. And... Uh, um, Well, there it is. So you can see where Craney Island is. Of course, out in front, you can see the entire Union fleet there. Five major capital ships. Franklin Buchanan calls his men onto the gun deck and says to them, Men, today we must do our duty, not just our duty, but more than our duty. Then he points at the Union ships and says, those ships must be taken. Some of all you all have complained, I have not taken you close to the enemy. I will take you there now. To your cannons, to your death, we will sink before surrender. Now, this is a shakedown cruise. No one was expecting this. No one, the idea of sink before surrender is not a 
really positive one. And, and so actually one of the surgeons, Ashton, excuse me. Um, uh, wow. I'll remember his name in a moment. Uh, but uh, he comes to Buchanan and says, Dinwiddie Phillips is his name and says, uh, Captain Buchanan, how can we attack the Union fleet today? Our ship is untried. And Buchanan merely says, if we sink the enemy's fleet, we know our ship is a success. If they sink us, we're indeed a failure. Oh my gosh, you know, everyone's quiet. And so the Virginia comes into Hampton Roads. It takes a course that brings them up like this and then makes a turn. So this is a Saturday, and it's wash day in the U.S. Navy. So from the yard arms of many of the sailing ships are what? Undies and everything, right? And so they are shocked by the arrival of the Virginia. Actually, Raleigh Colson, who's at Ragged Island, which is right across where you see Camp Butler, he says, oh, the steam was getting up in all the ships. Down came, you know, all the clothes and the ships prepared for action. Now, the Virginia um, Buchanan knows that there's only one ship that might be able to damage his ship. And that is going to be the USS Cumberland because of that rifled gun on board. So he takes aim at that. Now remember, here comes the Virginia across Hampton Roads. They describe it as a floating barn roof with a chimney belching smoke or like a half submerged crocodile intent on evil. Well, I have to say that it was intent on evil. The first shot of the day is fired by uh, the tug known as the Beaufort that was going with of the Virginia into Hampton Roads. Um, it was fired back by the Zouave, and then the Zouave quickly <coughs> went back to where the main Union ships were. The Virginia will pass the Cumberland, um, the Cumberland, of course, uh, it, or Congress, excuse me, uh, fires a broadside of 26 guns. These are 32 pounder Paxson shell guns, they bounce off the side of the Virginia like pebbles thrown against a brick wall. And as a result of this, um, you know, the Virginia fires a salvo back, 6.4 inch brook gun. One of the nine inch Dahlgrens has been fitted to fire hot shot and then two other shell guns. So the shot rumbles through the Congress uh, John Randolph Eggleston said, who fired the hot shot gun, say, I can't believe I attacked my floating home of two years. Yes, he had been assigned to the Congress prior uh, to the war. So what's going to happen is one of the hot shot logs near the uh, magazine uh, fires break out in the Congress. Buchanan does not stop. He heads straight for the Cumberland, and he'll ram the Cumberland in its forward, forward starboard quarter, right? And the ram, you know, as it approaches, it fires its seven inch brook gun, blows the pivot gun off the deck. Um, it will uh, then ram, you hear a crushing of timbers, uh, and, you know, uh, Dabney Minor. Uh, flag lieutenant on board the Cumberland, uh, on board the Virginia, will run down the deck saying, our cleaver has cut her open. Uh, yes, there's a mortal wound inflicted on the Union ship. Now, uh, what will happen, however, as E.A. Jack, a third assistant engineer down in the engine room, he will say, I felt our ship's shudder with the impact, and then I felt our ship take on a decidingly dangerous tilt. Well, that's right. The, now, remember I told you about the bad engines? Well, it's time to put the ship in reverse. And guess what? <laughs> it doesn't go directly into reverse. You, you actually, you can go see a model of the engine and actually you had to take crowbars to turn the gears to put it into reverse. 
what does that mean? Uh, it's stuck. And as the Cumberland is going down, so it appears the Virginia is going down. A swell comes, turns the Virginia, and breaks off the ram, which had been improperly mounted. Uh, nevertheless, one of the flanges had been cracked. And as a result of that, the Virginia breaks away and floats about 50 feet away from the Cumberland. And for the next half hour, the one of the fiercest moments of naval combat occurs between the Virginia and the Cumberland. Um, George Uphan Morris is keeping his men at the crew. Thomas uh, O. Selfridge Jr. actually will say, oh, you know, I should have dropped the anchor on the Virginia, so I'd take her down with us. But, you know, there's other things for him to do, and he thought about it as an afterthought. Nevertheless, that half hour is set. Most of the damage the Virginia receives during um, the battle, uh, uh, the two-day battle, will be caused by the Cumberland. They blow off two muzzles of guns, one of which you can see in the monitor center. Um, and uh, it also riddles the smokestack. In, in fact, Dinwiddie Phillips will later say that the smokestack was so riddled, a flock of crew, crows could fly through unimpeded. Wow. The cutter was blown away. The iron plate was cracked. And so... After a half hour, the Cumberland begins to shudder as George Uphan Morris shouts to the crew, give her another broadsize as we go. The Cumberland will sink, right? Um, and it will, of course, um, be a, this, this shocking for the entire battlefield, right? Down goes the Cumberland. Um, the Cumberland will only sink so that its, its mass still appear of, over the water. The flag is still flying, and in fact, the Cumberland was defeated, yet still defiant. All the crew of the Virginia thought about it. Let me tell you, when, if you were in the casemate of the Virginia at this point in time, um, during the actual trading of broadsides, you would have, uh, what would it have been like? You know, uh, actually, when the first shots hit the Virginia, everybody ducks. Charles Cale, uh, Carroll Sims, who's commander of the seven inch forward brook gun, says, Be men, men. Uh, I have taken shot in open air worse than this. And everyone realizes that shield actually works. Then, you know, during the battle, just think of what it was like. Um, uh, you know, when, uh, I guess, Jack Hunt and, uh, uh, and another sailor were talking to each other, just no matter what it smelled like, right? You have coal smoke, you have gun smoke, right? And uh, uh, so this mixture smells like the nether regions, as one said. In fact, Jack, Jack Cronin turns to John Hunt and says, don't it smell like hell? And the reply was, yes, and we'll soon be there. The Virginia was actually coated with what's called ship grease, a mixture of bacon fat, right, and tallow. So this is crackling because of the shells bursting on it. So, you know, smelling bacon, coal, and uh, uh, gun smoke surely is from the nether regions as we have heard it to be. Uh, so um, this, th these men are shocked. Um, actually, the Virginia suffers several casualties as a result of this part of the battle. Nevertheless, the Virginia then goes up the James River because it has to have room to turn around. It took the ship a half hour to turn around. So we're at 3.30 when the ramming takes place. This is now about four o'clock in the afternoon. And so the ship turns 
And as it does that maneuver, it um, shells several transports along the shore, just drawing two and then capturing another. Then after it makes it turn, it heads straight for the Cumberland or the Congress. The Congress has run aground and, but unfortunately it's bow or stern is facing out. So it doesn't have adequate um, firepower to contest the Virginia. Uh, the Virginia uh, will come. This is Joseph Smith, the commander of the Congress. Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith Sr. was on the ironclad board. Yes, the people that decide what ironclads the U.S. Navy is going to build in counter to uh, the Merrimack. Oh, yes, it is still burning. The flames aren't, they don't really, they put out the flame near the magazine. Uh, but yes, it's mortally wounded. Um, and so it ran aground, tried to save itself. The Virginia gets in with about 100 yards of it. Now, it runs aground. If you cross the Monitor Merrimack Bridge all the time and you're going over to Suffolk, Chesapeake, Look to the right, the coal pier, that's right. You'll see a red buoy actually. And, and that's where uh, the Cumberland uh, was sank. The red buoy actually marks where the Cumberland happens to be. It's still down there. So the Virginia comes and starts shelling the Congress. This man, will be hit by a shell fragment, losing his head and his shoulder. Um, and uh, so the, uh, this is a very gruesome battle. You know, we think about naval battles, small casualties versus land battles, but they were extremely brutal. So with his death, um, they decide to strike their colors. Um, Buchanan is as happy as he can be. Uh, you can see there's this burning um, uh, Congress. And so Buchanan gets out on top of the deck, right, the hurricane deck, and he's ordering the tugboats and ships from the James River Squadron that have all come down to Newport News Point. And they have, uh, um, you know, he says, go get the prisoners, the wounded, and then burn the ship. Well, it just so happens that Buchanan's brother, Thomas McKean Buchanan, is paymaster on board the Congress. So, you know, he'd like to save his brother if he can. Um, and so basically, while he's there, actually the commander of the Union troops on Newport News Point, a man known as Brigadier, Jos Brigadier General Joseph King Fenno Mansfield, a graduate of West Point class of 1821. He will uh, be, uh, you know, appearing everywhere. A shell goes through his headquarters. He's not happy. Uh, so he orders his men to fire on the Virginia and the uh, Congress. And one officer goes up to Mansfield, says, uh, General Mansfield, uh, they're under a flag of truce. We can't fire. And he merely says, I haven't surrendered, have I? and fire on them. So Buchanan, who's watching the scene uh, somewhere near the smokestack, uh, doesn't like what he sees. So he orders a Marine to give him a musket and he starts shooting at the soldiers on the shore. Well, if you're a Union soldier on the shore and you have this crazy guy on top of a ship that just destroyed two of your ships, what are you gonna do? Well, you're going to fire at him. And he gets shot in the hip, grievously wounded. He's taken down below. As they take him through the gun deck, he shouts, Don't worry, men. The wound is not mortal. I will soon be back amongst you. Then he turns to his executive officer, Catesby App Roger Jones, and says, Burn that vessel. Plug her full of hot shot till she glows. And that's exactly what happens. Um, the Cumberland will be a burning wreck. In fact, it will explode a little after midnight uh, on uh, March 9th. And the glow of the 
Congress burning. You can imagine, uh, you know, specks of flame running down the yacht arms and so forth. It was, it lit up the entire Hampton Roads. And in fact, it lit it up so that the monitor could find its way uh, to uh, where the Minnesota ran aground. You see, when the Confederates began their attack, the Minnesota, the Roanoke, and the St. Lawrence all go, because the idea was, we're going to surround that ironclad, and we're going to pound it into submission. Well, um, the Roanoke takes a wide route. It runs aground on middle ground. Um, the St. Lawrence tries to cut the corner at Newport News Point, runs aground on the Hampton Bar, and so does the Minnesota. The Minnesota runs aground so firmly that it can't get off. And so it is a sitting duck as the Virginia, after knowing the Congress is done, comes back into Hampton Roads. I have to tell you, um, you know, it's getting dark. Right, and so the Virginia fires at the St. Lawrence, fires at the Minnesota, causing fires on both, damaging the Minnesota, damages the Zouave, shoots off its rudder post. However, due to darkness, it has to go back to a buoy. It has off of Sewell's Point, right where the aircraft carriers are, and there it waits for the morrow to finish destroying the Union fleet. March 8, 1862 was the greatest U.S. Navy defeat until Pearl Harbor. It shocked the nation. It proved the revolution uh, of naval warfare. It actually proved the power of iron over wood that no longer would we rely on wooden warships. Now they must be made of iron with rifled and heavy shell guns to be able to control the waves. So the Battle of March 8th was a stirring Confederate victory. It brought hope to the Confederacy that those ironclads it was building in New Orleans, Memphis, are going to be the thing that could turn the tide of the war in their favor. However, as I had said, the eerie glow of the Congress enables the monitor, that Union ironclad, to arrive and wait the Virginia's return on the next day. And that's the events of March 8th, 1862, where we prove the power of iron over wood. And I want to remind all of you all that you should always sink before surrender. Thank you. <laughs>